Thanks for the kind intro. I'm glad we have the technology at least working mostly uh, here in the, one of the world's most successful technology companies. Um, um, you would have thought I was presenting in Redmond, Washington. No, I'm joking. Um, sorry, sorry. It was just it was right down the middle. It was too easy. It was too easy. Uh, you give me a fat pitch, I'm going to hit it or, inve or invest in it, I suppose. Um, so we've done the intros. I'm Pat. Um, used to run Morningstar's equity research group. Uh, currently have my own investment firm called Dorsey Asset Management, uh, which is a global firm, a global mandate. We can invest anywhere in the world, anywhere, any market cap. We're very concentrated, and our goal really is to find 10 to 15 of the world's most competitively advantaged businesses that can compound at high rates over time, invest in them, and then leave them alone to make lots of money over time. That's our job, and that's what we're actively engaged in doing right now. And the framework we use uh, is in large part based on the work I did at Morningstar and the concept of economic moats and reinvesting capital at high rates of return. And that's what I want to talk about today. So the basic foundation of thinking about economic moats and competitive advantage is that, shocker, capitalism works. And that capital seeks the highest returns possible. If a company is making a lot of money, others will seek to compete with it. That's you know, intuitively makes sense. If I wrote each of you a $50 million VC check and said, go start a business, you would probably try to do something profitable. If you are smart, you probably would not start airlines. I hope. <laughs> I hope. Um, high profits attract competition. I mean, as surely as night follows day. So intuitively, this makes sense. Empirically, it makes sense as well. If you go back over time and look at, say, take T1, companies in the highest decile of returns on capital, and roll the clock forward 10, 15 years, and look at that cohort of companies, most will have lower levels of profitability. Most will have lower returns on capital, as their returns on capital have drifted down to some mean as competition has come in. Of course, there is a minority of businesses where that's not the case. So you know, most businesses, you see high returns on capital decrease over time as competition comes in. However, there is a very small minority of businesses that enjoy many years of high returns on capital. Uh, they essentially beat the odds. They defy economic gravity. And the question simply becomes, how? And in my view, it's because they've created structural advantages, economic moats, a way of insulating themselves, buffering themselves against the competition that enables them to maintain supranormal returns on capital longer than academic theory and the averages would suggest. Because absent a moat, competition destroys excess returns, period and full stop. Any highly profitable business that is easy to compete with, you will see that come down over time. Um, very common in the fashion industry, very common, say, in, you know, if you guys remember back NVIDIA and what was the other big graphics company, chip company? A A you know, they would swap market shares like every six months. Mm -hmm. You know, what had the best chip? Oh, no, I've got the best chip. Da, 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 da. And there's no moat there. The moat was just, what do I got that's great today? And then you got a lot of smart engineers at the other place trying to make the next best thing. So the basics of moats are that they're structural and sustainable qualities that are inherent to the business. A moat is part and parcel of the business that you're looking at. It's not a hot product. We all probably remember the Krispy Kreme debacle. Uh, they taste good, but you know, sugar is not a moat. Um, <laughs> Heelys, anybody remember Heelys? Remember those, those little shoes with the wheel in the heel? That was an $800 million company at one point. I, I kid you, I mean, yes, I, you know, I, I am, as Dave Barry would say, I am not making this up. Um, people were valuing Healy's as if it had a moat. Aside from the massive product liability issues, uh, once basically schools started banning them. And so that's a problem if your target audience of 12-year-olds can't buy your product anymore. Uh, and so that, that business went to hell pretty fast. Um, it's not just a cool piece of technology. We talked about NVIDIA and the graphics companies a moment ago. Remember iOmega? Remember that was going to be the thing. It's just a cool piece of technology. And frankly, any cool piece of technology can be replicated by other smart engineers, unless there's some switching cost, some lock-in effect that occurs, uh, that you know, or an industry standard is created. But you know, 
anything that one smart bunch of guys can develop, there's probably another smart bunch of guys somewhere else trying to make it even better. And of course, it's not the biggest market share. You will often hear companies talk about, oh, we're the biggest, we're going for market share. Let's think about GM, let's think about Compaq. It didn't work out so well. Big is not a moat. In fact, small is often a better moat than big. Moats generally manifest themselves in pricing power. A company that can't raise prices is unlikely to have a strong moat. And in fact, if you invest, this is a test often that businesses are losing competitive advantage. If you hear a company say, well, you know, you have a company who typically raises prices 2, 3, 4% every year. You know, they're able to kind of keep pricing power moving up. And then one year, suddenly they don't. They say, well, the economy's tough, or you know, we want to take it easy on the customers this year. That's a load of crap. It means that something has changed in that industry. There's a competitor out there. There is some event going on that you may not be aware of that's causing them to lose that pricing power. Because if you can take price, you will take price as a business. And so if companies that lose that pricing power, that's usually the first sign that their moat is eroding. So what I want to do next is talk about the four kinds of moats that uh, I identified when we were at Morningstar and that I still think make sense today. The way we identified these was by going back about, this was, would have been the later, about 50 years of CompuStat data. And it was pretty simple, just looking at businesses that had maintained returns on capital above cost of capital for 15 years plus. You know, it's not a huge data set. And then you basically say, what are the common characteristics of these businesses? What are the similarities of these businesses? And that's where we kind of teased out these four categories. And they've proven to work out pretty well. These are what we introduced the moat ratings at Morningstar in about 01. And so now we've had about 12, 15, 13 years. And the businesses we initially identified as being wide moat businesses that fell into these buckets have maintained higher returns on capital than their peers. So the, the, the empirical results seem to bear out the theory. Um, first kind of intangible asset is a brand. Um, and a brand is valuable if it either increases your willingness to pay or lowers your search costs. And this is really important. It's not just that it's well known. Because you think of like, say, Sony. We've all heard of Sony, right? Sony is often ranked as one of the 20 most valuable brands on the planet by the business week, brand week thingy that, that happens every year. But let me just do a quick survey in this room. How many of you would pay 20% more for a Sony DVD player? <laughs> One hand? Maybe, maybe Any hands? 15, maybe 15 years ago. Like 20 years maybe 15 years ago. That's exactly it. And like right now, you do see like the Sony Bravia TVs getting a little bit of a price premium over others because it's newer. DVDs were newer. But consumer electronics is fast cycle stuff. right? What's new today is old next week. And so the fact that Sony is well known, and we've heard a lot about it, does not contribute one bit to its competitive advantage. In fact, I would argue Sony could probably save a heck of a lot of money by not advertising, or advertising very little. You know, they, on Michigan Ave in Chicago, where I work, they have this super expensive flagship store with all kinds of cool stuff you can play with, and I'm sure they're paying God knows what in rent. Useless, because that brand doesn't change your behavior. By contrast, let's look at Tiffany. Tiffany will charge you 20% more for the exact same diamond that you can buy from Blue Nile or Zales or Hellsberg or whoever you want. 20% is the value of that pale blue box. I can guarantee you the cardboard ain't that expensive. <laughs> okay? But that's what but you know, as the giver of a diamond, that you'll probably get a bigger smile off the recipient if it's in a <laughs> Tiffany box than if it's not in a Tiffany box. So they can charge it. And so that brand has value, right? That brand increases your willingness to pay. And there's value there. You also have brands that lower search costs. So think about Coca-Cola or Wrigley Gum. You, know, you don't pay a lot more for Coke versus Pepsi, but you know you like Coke, so you go there. You, know, you like Heinz, so you grab it off the shelf, because you don't want to sit there and compare ketchup prices for 20 minutes before buying the ketchup. It's three bucks. My kids like ketchup. Let's go get the ketchup. I mean, we go through ketchup in vats at my house. I have twin seven-year-olds, and I think ketchup is like our fifth food group. It's ridiculous. Um, so brands, again, a brand changes consumer behavior uh, by increasing the willingness to pay or reducing the search cost. Then it has value. Just being well-known doesn't mean anything at all. Patents, obviously a patent is a legal monopoly, but they are subject to expiration, challenge, and piracy. And so you want to be very careful of a business, you see this a lot in like specialty pharmaceuticals, where you have one 
asset, one drug driving all of your economic value, that patent gets challenged, you're dead. And last time I checked, patent lawyers drive really nice cars. And there's a reason for that, which is that patents are valuable to challenge. And so if they can be challenged, they will be challenged. So the, the, when you want to rely on patents as a moat when you have a portfolio of them. That, you know, it's hard to invalidate one or the other. Think of Qualcomm, think of Arm Holdings, where there's this huge portfolio of patents. And then finally, licenses and approvals. So you have a license to do something that is not many people can do, or an approval. That is a pretty solid economic moat. Casinos, not easy to get a casino license. You have six of them in Macau. That's it. They ain't giving out anymore. Uh, landfills, no one likes to live near a landfill. So municipalities don't give out tons of landfill licenses because then nobody wants to live there. That reduces the tax base. So once you have a landfill or a gravel pit, you probably aren't going to get a whole lot more of them. Aircraft parts are the same thing. They have to be FAA certified. And that's a huge moat in the aircraft parts industry. Most aircraft parts are sole source. They have one manufacturer who makes them. And so they get about a 40% margin on aftermarket. It's a beautiful business. If you're doing, selling a brand, if you're a company, here's what you want to look for when you're looking at brand-based companies. Brands are valuable if they deliver a consistent or aspirational experience. Now, consistency lowers search costs and drives loyalty. So what you don't want to do is change the damn product. That's the stupidest thing possible. Remember New Coke? <coughs> Idiotic. Schlitz. Schlitz used to be the second highest selling beer in the US, most volume in the US. Now, not so much, right? And the reason was they changed the way it was made. They changed the taste of Schlitz. Why would you do this? <laughs> you know, recently I thought I mean, there was something like, like I think I was with the Heinz or there was actually a ketchup that was going to lower the amount of sugar content. They were going to change the recipe. And you just go, stop. If people are buying this, why change it? Aspiration, by contrast, increases willingness to pay. So what you want to do is create scarcity and exclusivity. Very interesting example, Tiffany stores. Now, Tiffany is unique in that we think of it as a very expensive brand, but over 40% of their revenue comes from stuff that sells for under 200 bucks. Weird, right? You wouldn't think about that. And it's, it's brilliant. I mean, they're one of the only companies that they, they can hit volume and hit high price. Um, but here's how they do it, one of the ways they do it, by maintaining the brand. You would think that the stuff that drives 40% of your sales, that'd be at the front of the store, right? You want people to get easy access to that. No, 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 no. Go into a Tiffany store. The cheap stuff is at the back. So the expensive stuff, the stuff that costs more than a Tesla, that's sitting in the front of the store. Because that keeps the value of the brand up. That maintains an aura of exclusivity and scarcity. And so they keep the brand value up. Or Patek Philippe. Uh, very expensive watch brand. The slogan, which I love, you don't own a Patek Philippe, you take care of it for the next generation. I mean, what a great image, right, for those of us who can afford $50,000 watches. Um, but it maintains that scarcity and exclusivity value. And again, let's look at it, if you're looking at brand-based companies, aspirations differ. So you want to think about companies that can adapt. A great example is Jack Daniels, owned by Brown, Brown Foreman. These are two different Jack Daniels ads. Um, I'm going to do the translations based on what I've been told. I don't speak Russian or Chinese. Um, so this says, happy birthday, Mr. Jack. And if you can look at it, see it, it's the same image we have of Jack Daniels here. The frontier, the cowboy, old school. And in Russia, that works. Because you, you know, a lot of Russians own dachas. They like to get out of the city and get back to kind of their sort of Slavic roots. Now compare that with this. Jack Daniels ad in China. You're in a very high-end bar, very urban, very smooth, very cool. And I mean, I've gotten this translated, but I may have anyone can any I see a few folks here who might speak to you wanna translate that for me? So it simply means confidence is not in your mouth, but from other people's eyes. Confidence is not in your out of your mouth, but comes from other people's eyes. In other words, confidence is how people see you. Right? Totally different, right? Because imagine in China if you had this ad that basically was like, you should go back to the village you came from. <laughs> That's going to sell a premium spirit, right? Uh huh. Uh, you know? So again, but here you see this ad adaptation. That's what you want to see in a brand based company. Second kind of economic moat switching costs. Very simple. Does the cost of switching to a competing product outweigh the benefits? 
What you want to do is look for companies that integrate with the company customer's business. So the upfront costs of implementation get huge payback from renewals. Think about an Oracle database, for example. If you're P&G, if you're Citigroup and you're running on an Oracle database, ripping that out is virtually impossible. It's not impossible, but it's really, 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 really hard. I mean, if, if, if you showed up today, I mean, if Google, for example, built an amazing database and showed up to P&G and said, we've got Google Base, and it's 15% faster and 20% cheaper than Oracle's best product, P&G would say, yes, and I will have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars and however many man hours ripping out what I have now, and my business will probably blow up when I do that. So the switching costs are very high. And so Oracle can raise price, 2 to 3% every year. See this a lot with uh, enterprise software companies. You also see it with data processors, people that integrate tightly with the customer's business. You can also sell an ongoing service relationship. So think of um, elevators. Once you have an elevator in a building, it probably ain't coming out again. Um, and so you get elevator companies like Otis, which is part of United Technologies, uh, Cone, which is a Finnish company, Schindler, which is German. And their goal is to have a high, what's called attach rate to attach a service contract to the elevator. Because once that elevator is in there, it ain't coming out again. And so you get this long service relationship. Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce typically sells its jet engines on what's called power by the hour. They actually sell it, and then you pay for it based on how much you use it. You don't just pay for it up front, and then someone else maintains it. So that's a way of increasing the switching cost. And then you can provide a product with a very high benefit to cost ratio. A uh, favorite example here is a company called Fastenal here in the US. You know, if you have one bolt on your assembly line that goes down, and then you have a whole bunch of unionized guys standing around basically getting paid for not doing anything, you will pay a lot of money to get that bolt back on the line really quickly. And so that product doesn't have a very high economic cost in terms of how much you spend for the bolt, but has a huge benefit to your organization. You, uh, Fuchs Petrolube, uh, or Lubrizol, which Berkshire bought a while back, same thing, lubricants. If you have a lubricant, that can increase the uptime of a giant mining machine down in a hole by 10%. So you don't have to take it down for maintenance as often. You don't have to take it apart and lube everything. And you get more productivity out of it. And that lubricant costs even 20% more than the competing lubricant. It's such a tiny cost of the overall part, of the overall cost of running that machine. Why not? So this high benefit cost ratio is really a cool thing to look for when you're looking for businesses with switching costs. You've got the network effect, which is simply providing a service that increases in value as the number of users expands. You can aggregate demand between fragmented parties. Think of distributors. Uh, Henry Schein is a dental distributor. So basically, most dentists are you know, little owner operators, two, three, four, five dentists in a practice. And then they've got to buy stuff. They've got to buy those obnoxious cotton things that stick in your mouth and suck up the saliva and give you cotton mouth, literally. Um, you know, you've got to buy dental drills and all kinds of stuff. And basically, what they're doing is aggregating fragmented demand, fragmented supply, and they bring the two together and extract a lot of economic rents by doing that. Um, one thing to watch for here is that one reason the network effect works so well is the nonlinearity of nodes versus connections. So if you have a web and you have you know, the number of nodes in that web goes from one to two to three to four, the number of connections increases exponentially. So that is something that makes it very hard to replicate a network once the network gains scale. Uh, something that Googlers should be pretty familiar with, I think. Um, one thing you want to watch for, though, is radial versus interactive networks. So the interactive network is what I just described, the web, where each node interacts with the other. A radial network is less valuable. So this is a good lesson I learned at Morningstar when we looked at Western Union. So Western Union you know, sends a lot of, you know, helps people send money from place to place. And they talk about, we have the most number of branches of any money transfer organization in the world, which is true. The problem is that no one is sending money from Bangladesh to Mexico City. They're sending money from Mexico City to Chicago, or from Mexico City to LA, or from Bangladesh to Chicago. We have a huge Bangladeshi community there. No one's sending money from Bangladesh to Mexico City or vice versa. So that route means nothing. So it's basically a series of channels, a series of spokes off different nodes that are easier for a competitor to pick off by underpricing service in that node. So radial networks are much, much less robust than interactive ones, we found. And then the final uh, type of moat, cost advantages. This is uh, you know, kind of, kind of self-explanatory. But the thing is there's a couple of differences here that you should look for when you're looking at companies. A process-based advantage 
is basically inventing a cheaper way to do something that is hard to replicate quickly. Southwest did this. Dell did this. Ryanair did this. Inditex, which is, owns the Zara brand you may be familiar with, great example that you know, everyone, you know, they had you know, their, the clothes made in Sri Lanka, the clothes made in, Cologne, in Bangladesh because it was really cheap. But of course, because of transport links, you have to basically make a fashion bet six months in advance. What Inditex figured out was that if they nearshore it, if they get the stuff made in North Africa, get the stuff made in Eastern Europe, they could have much faster response times, much faster responses to different fashion trends. Now, you can copy that, right? You can copy that, but it works pretty well while you're doing it. And so process-based cost advantages tend to work well, but then they get copied eventually. Southwest no longer has the lowest uh, cost per available seat mile. People saw what they did and copied it. Scale, by contrast, when you spread your fixed costs over a large base, that tends to be much, much more robust. So think about this big network of brown, brown UPS vans going around a neighborhood. What's the additional cost of putting one more package on the UPS van? De minimis, right? And so your margin on that is very, very high. Very difficult to compete. Good example, DHL, which is a wonderfully run business, has a very dense network in Europe. They lost over a billion dollars trying to compete with UPS and FedEx in the ground market in the US. Couldn't do it, simply because they couldn't scale up. There weren't as many yellow vans as there were brown vans and blue and white vans. Um, Scale-based advantages, especially in distribution, are incredibly robust. And you can have a niche where you establish minimum efficient scale. There are some niches, some industries, that can only profitably support one or two players. If another player comes in, spends the money to get in, returns come down so that nobody makes any money, so that new entrant never comes in the market. That can be, a, you know, the businesses often can't grow very well because they're kind of trapped there, but they can be enormously profitable. So what about management? You notice I haven't said a word about management yet. There's a great quote from Warren Buffett that good jockeys will do well on good horses, but not on broken down nags. So this is a professional jockey on a goat. He is a very good manager. Sadly, he is on a bad vehicle called a goat. So if you enter this in a race, he's probably going to lose. By contrast, if you got me, and I don't even know how to ride a horse, as long as I don't fall off, I probably beat the goat. Because the horse is better suited for winning races than the goat. You're not going to get much milk out of it. The goat is better for that. But it's very well suited for winning races. So the key here is that you want to get a good horse. You want to look for good horses. It's not that the jockey is irrelevant. It's that even the best jockey, if he's on a goat, isn't going to make you a lot of money or win many races. Managers matter in the context of the moat. And the way to think about this is very simple. The required level of managerial skill is inversely related to the quality of the business. The worse the business, the better the manager. The better the business, uh, as long as management isn't that stupid, you'll do fine. If it's a really bad business, you better have an awesome manager. This is Ryanair. O'Leary is an absolute genius. He's a jerk, and customers hate flying Ryanair. But he has created an amazing, amazing business. Ryanair is scale advantages to die for. By contrast, if you have a great business, genius <laughs> is not needed. You saw where this was going, I know. He's actually, what, what, what that actually means is, here's what's happened to Microsoft's moat while I've been in charge. Um, I, it, yeah, it's an easy target here at Google, but, and it, but it's true. I mean, you know, I mean, Steve Ballmer essentially spent 12 years setting money on fire at Microsoft, as far as I can tell. What do you think uh, about Twitter? Um, well, Twitter, um, never followed it much. And also, I haven't, that wasn't, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the question was, what about Twitter? Um, I, I haven't figured out what the monetization model is. I haven't figured out how they make money. I mean, they may have some secret theory. I just don't know what it is. I, but I haven't spent much time on it. Although I think it was founded by a guy named Dorsey, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I probably should look at it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the key here is that moats can buffer management mistakes. Microsoft minted money despite Steve Ballmer. Despite them shoveling money, dirt in the moat every day, the core office, the core Windows franchises were strong enough that the business overall maintained pretty high returns on capital. New Coke didn't kill Coca-Cola because the business was robust enough, the brand is strong enough. Moody's put profits before integrity. 
actively screwed investors and still cranked out a 40% operating margin. That's a pretty good moat. But even a genius like David Neeleman couldn't change the fact that JetBlue is an airline, which is the worst industry known to mankind. I mean, he's an amazing manager. If you've ever met him, read any of his books, seen him speak, he's incredible, he's inspirational. You know, JetBlue was like 30 odd times earnings when it went public because it had leather seats and TV. I mean, an airline will never have lower costs than the day it opens for business. Why? Planes don't get newer, they get older. Employees don't get less seniority, they get more. So the planes cost more to run, the employees want more money. So the cost structure is inevitably bound to decline. Again, great jockey on a goat. Good managers are constantly looking for ways to widen a company's moat. Think about Amazon's focus on the customer experience. It's not so much about scale, it's about the customer experience. Here's a great, uh, let me try this here. I've done try this at other talks around the world. How many of you have bought something off Amazon without checking the price elsewhere? Okay, that's like two thirds, three quarters of the hands. Isn't that an amazing statistic right there? I mean, how hard is it to click to another website? What's the caloric cost of moving your mouse? It's not high, right? But, and so, but I, I've talked to probably 45 CFA societies around the world. I get that's about, about the same number of hands that go up, except in Germany. The Germans didn't seem to, you know, I mean, maybe <laughs> Amazon hasn't done as well. Maybe, Amazon has not been as, I mean, there's more, there's Alondo, there's a lot of other e retailers there, but the US, this is the response you get. And a lot of that, a lot of this is the customer experience, right? Trust matters more online than offline. And I give Amazon enormous credit for figuring this out early. That offline, in a regular physical store, I give you money, you give me a good, and we're finished. There's no trust involved. Online, I have to trust you send me what I ordered. I have to trust you don't steal my credit card number. I have to trust it arrives when you say it will. I have to trust you'll take it back if you say you will. There's a lot of trust involved. And that, enables, that enabled the ability to build a moat, build a brand in retailing, which is a really tough industry to do that in. Think about Costco's focus on using scale to lower costs. Costco gets bigger, cost savings go right back to the customer. That brings in more customers, which allows more cost savings that go right back to the customer. That's what drives their business. That's all they think about every day. Now, by contrast, bad managers invest capital outside a company's moat which lowers overall returns on capital. This process is called diversification, or setting fire to large piles of cash. Okay, this is basically what you don't want to see a company doing. Example, Cisco moving into consumer markets, the Netgear acquisition I think it was. What on earth was that? You had this gorgeous sticky business in enterprise, and you start selling consumer electronics that any moron just buys off the shelf at Circuit City, I mean, I used to, my set-top box at home used to be a Cisco, and I would just curse that thing every time I looked at it. Because it was just the worst business to go into. I mean, just you know, fast product cycles, no competitive advantage. Um, the, the whole network-centric home, so what? Um, remember Garmin? Remember, remember the, anybody remember the Nuvi handset? No, if nobody? OK, so Garmin <laughs> had this great franchise, uh, partially in GPS devices uh, in their car, but also a much better franchise in avionics. So the, you know, your uh, business jets, regional jets, often have Garmin as the GPS device in there. Uh, you own a plane, you really want to know where you are. You know? So that business is not, this was a very good, sticky business. And so they say, they see, oh gosh, GPS is going from a product to a feature. That's basically just a feature of a smartphone. Oh, let's not relax to the inevitable and just get out of the business. Let's double down and go into handsets and compete with Ericsson and Nokia. Completely moronic. And so again, you see investing outside the moat. You see a business do that out of weakness as opposed to out of strength when they're trying to like, maintain growth like Cisco did. It's a horrible sign. Yep, question. How do you differentiate that from like, being innovative? Like Google, for example. Great question. No, I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. Um, so the, the question is, how do you differentiate that from being innovative? Because Google's doing it out of strength. Right? Google's not doing it to preserve growth or because their core business is dying. Google's doing it as a way of planting seeds for hopefully a great business in the future. And that means a subtle difference, but it's going, coming out, the key thing is it's coming out of strength. Google's core business isn't going down. It's when you see a company's core business either slowing 
or the competitive advantage eroding, and they try to basically invest outside that to bump up growth. So, you know, Cisco, one of the reasons they went into consumer electronics, Netgear, was to compensate for the fact that the enterprise market was slowing down. Or you can just say, hey guys, we'll grow at 6% and not 16 anymore. That would have been the more rational response. Instead, they go out and take a blowtorch to giant, giant piles of cash by buying, remember the flip? Remember the flip? 800 million bucks on this, you know, basically a little video camera that will about six months later be in your phone. I mean, you know, again, out of weakness versus out of strength.